Section number seven. Battered of the faith of men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. Battered by Jack London. Battered was a devil. This was recognized throughout the Northland. Hell's Spawn, he was called by many men. But his master, Black Leclerc, chose for him the shameful name Battered. Now Black Leclerc was also a devil, and the twain were well matched. There is a saying that when two devils come together, hell is to pay. This is to be expected, and this certainly was to be expected when Battered and Black Leclerc came together. The first time they met, Battered was a part-grown puppy, lean and hungry, with bitter eyes, and they met with snap and snarl, and wicked looks. For Leclerc's upper lip had a wolfish way of lifting and showing the white, cruel teeth, and it lifted then, and his eyes gleamed viciously as he reached for Battered and dragged him out from the squirming litter. It was certain that they divined each other, for on the instant Battered had buried his puppy fangs in Leclerc's hand, and Leclerc, thumb and finger, was coolly choking his young life out of him. Sacre dame, the Frenchman said softly, flirting the quick blood from his bitten hand and gazing down on the little puppy, choking and gasping in the snow. Leclerc turned to John Hamlin, storekeeper of the sixty-mile post. Dat foe, what a I like him, I'll mock, I'll buy him, now, I'll buy him queek. And because he hated him with an exceeding bitter hate, Leclerc bought Battered and gave him his shameful name. And for five years the twain adventured across the Northland from St. Michael's and the Yukon Delta to the head reaches of the Pelly, and even so far as the Peace River, Athabasca and Great Slave. And they acquired a reputation for uncompromising wickedness, the like of which never before attached itself to man and dog. Battered did not know his father, hence his name, but, as John Hamlin knew, his father was a great gray timber wolf, but the mother of Battered, as he dimly remembered her, was snarling, bickering, obscene, husky, full fronted, and heavy chested, with a malign eye, a cat like grip on life, and a genius for trickery and evil. There was neither faith nor trust in her. Her treachery alone could be relied upon and her wild wood amours attested her general depravity. Much of evil and much of strength were there in these, battered's progenitors, and, bone and flesh of their bone and flesh, he had inherited it all, and then came Black Leclerc to lay his heavy hand on the bit of pulsating puppy life, to press and prod and mold till it became a big, bristling beast acute in knavery, overspilling with hate, sinister, malignant, diabolical. With a proper master, Batard may have made an ordinary, fairly efficient sled dog. He never got the chance. Leclerc but confirmed him in his congenital iniquity. The history of Batard and Leclerc is a history of war of five cruel, relentless years of which their first meeting is fit summary. To begin with, it was Leclerc's fault, for he hated with understanding and intelligence, while the long-legged, ungainly puppy hated only blindly, instinctively, without reason or method. At first there were no refinements of cruelty. These were to come later. But simple beatings and crude brutalities in one of these, Batard had an ear injured. He never regained control of the riven muscles, 
and ever after the ear drooped limply down to keep keen the memory of his tormentor, and he never forgot. His puppyhood was a period of foolish rebellion. He was always worsted, but he fought back because it was his nature to fight back, and he was unconquerable. Yelping shrilly from the pain of lash and club, he none the less contrived always to throw in the defiant snarl, the bitter vindictive menace of his soul, which fetched without fail more blows and beatings. But his was his mother's tenacious grip on life. Nothing could kill him. He flourished under misfortune, grew fat with famine, and out of his terrible struggle for life developed a preternatural intelligence. His were the stealth and cunning of the husky, his mother, and the fierceness and valor of the wolf, his father. Possibly it was because of his father that he never wailed. His puppy yelps passed with his lanky legs, so that he became grim and taciturn, quick to strike, slow to warn. He answered curse with snarl and blow with snap, grinning the while his implacable hatred, but never again, under the extremest agony, did Leclerc bring from him the cry of fear nor of pain. This unconquerableness but fanned Leclerc's wrath and stirred him to great deviltries. Did Leclerc give Bittard half a fish and to his mates whole ones? Bittard went forth to rob other dogs of their fish. Also he robbed caches and expressed himself in a thousand rogueries, till he became a terror to all dogs and masters of dogs. Did Leclerc beat Petard and fondle Babette? Babette, who was not half the worker he was? Why? Petard threw her down in the snow and broke her hind leg with his heavy jaws, so that Leclerc was forced to shoot her. Likewise, in bloody battles, Petard mastered all his teammates, set them the law of the trail and forage, and made them live to the law he set. In five years he heard but one kind word, received but one soft stroke of a hand, and then he did not know what matter of things they were. He leaped like the untamed thing he was, and his jaws were together in a flash. It was the missionary at sunrise, a newcomer in the country, who spoke the kind word and gave the soft stroke of the hand, and for six months after he wrote no letters home to the States, and the surgeon at McQuestion traveled two hundred miles on the ice to save him from blood poisoning. Men and dogs looked askance at Petard when he drifted into their camps and posts. The men greeted him with feet threateningly lifted for the kick, the dogs with bristling manes and bared fangs. Once a man did kick Bittard, and Bittard, with quick wolf snap, closed his jaws like a steel trap on the man's calf and crunched down to the bone, whereat the man was determined to have his life. Only Black Leclerc, with ominous eyes and naked hunting knife, stepped in between. The killing of Bittard, ah, sacre dam, that was a pleasure Leclerc reserved for himself. Some day it would happen, or else, bah, who was to know? Anyway, the problem would be solved. For they had become problems to each other. The very breath each drew was a challenge and a menace to the other. Their hate bound them together as love could never bind. Leclerc was bent on coming of the day when Bittard should wilt in spirit and cringe and whimper at his feet. And Bittard, Leclerc knew what was in Bittard's mind, and more than once had read it in Bittard's eyes. And so clearly he had read that when Bittard was at his back, he made it a point 
to glance often over his shoulder. Men marveled when Leclerc refused large money for the dog. Some day you'll kill him and be out his price, said John Hamilton once, when Batard lay panting in the snow where Leclerc had kicked him, and no one knew whether his ribs were broken, and no one dared look to see. That, said Leclerc, dryly, that is my business, monsieur. And the men marveled that Batard did not run away. They did not understand, but Leclerc understood. He was a man who lived much in the open, beyond the sound of human tongue, and he had learned the voices of wind and storm, the sight of night, the whisper of dawn, the clash of day. In a dim way he could hear the green things growing, the running of the sap, the bursting of the bud, and he knew the subtle speech of things that moved, of the rabbit in the snare, the moody raven beating the air with hollow wing, the bald face shuffling under the moon, the wolf like a gray shadow gliding betwixt the twilight and the dark. And to him Batard spoke clear and direct. Full well he understood why Batard did not run away, and he looked more often over his shoulder. When in anger, Batard was not nice to look upon, and more than once had he leapt for Leclerc's throat, to be stretched quivering and senseless in the snow by the butt of the ever-ready dog-whip. And so Batard learned to bide his time. When he reached his full strength and prime of youth, he thought the time had come. He was broad-chested, powerfully muscled, of far more than ordinary size, and his neck, from head to shoulders, was a mass of bristling hair, to all appearances a full-blooded wolf. Leclerc was lying deep in his furs when Batard deemed the time to be ripe. He crept upon him stealthily, head low to earth, and lone ear laid back, with a feline softness of tread. Batard breathed gently, very gently, and not till he was close at hand did he raise his head. He paused for a moment and looked at the bronzed bull throat, naked and knotty, and swelling to a deep steady pulse. The slaver dripped down his fangs and slid off his tongue at the sight, and in that moment he remembered his drooping ear, his uncounted blows and prodigious wrongs and without a sound sprang on the sleeping man. Leclerc awoke to the pang of the fangs in his throat, and, perfect animal that he was, he awoke clear-headed and with full comprehension. He closed on Batard's windpipe with both his hands, and rolled out of his furs to get his weight uppermost. But the thousands of Batard's ancestors had clung at the throats of unnumbered moose and caribou, and dragged them down. And the wisdom of those ancestors was his. When Leclerc's weight came on top of him, he drove his hind legs upwards and in, and clawed down chest and abdomen, ripping and tearing through skin and muscle, and when he felt the man's bloody wince above him, and lift, he worried and shook at the man's throat. His teammates closed around in a snarling circle, and Batard, with failing breath and fading sense, knew that their jaws were hungry for him. But that did not matter. It was the man, the man above him, and he ripped and clawed and shook and worried to the last ounce of his strength. But Leclerc choked him with both his hands, till Batard's chest heaved and writhed for the air denied, and his eyes glazed and set, and his jaws slowly loosened, and his tongue protruded black and swollen. Eh, Bon, you devil! Leclerc gurgled, mouth and throat clogged with his own blood, and he shoved the dizzy dog from him, and then Leclerc cursed the other dogs off as they fell upon Batard. 
they drew back into a wider circle, squatting alertly on their haunches and licking their chops, the hair on every neck, bristling and erect. Batard recovered quickly, and at the sound of Leclerc's voice, tottered to his feet and swayed weakly back and forth. Ah, you big devil, Leclerc sputtered. I fix you. I fix you plenty, by gar. Batard, the air biting into his exhausting lungs, like wine, flushed full into the man's face, his jaws missing and coming together with a metallic clip. They rolled over and over on the snow, Leclerc striking madly with his fists. Then they separated, face to face, and circled back and forth before each other. Leclerc could have drawn his knife. His rifle was at his feet, but the beast in him was up and raging. He would do the thing with his hands and his teeth. Batard sprang in, but Leclerc knocked him over with a blow of his fist, fell upon him, and buried his teeth to the bone in the dog's shoulder. It was a primordial setting and a primordial scene, such as might have been in the savage youth of the world, an open space in a dark forest, a ring of grinning wolf-dogs, and in the center two beasts, locked in combat, snapping and snarling, raging madly about, panting, sobbing, cursing, straining, wild with passion, in a fury of murder, ripping and tearing and clawing in elemental brutishness. But Leclerc caught Batard behind the ear with a blow from his fist, knocking him over, and, for the instant, stunning him. Then Leclerc leaped upon him with his feet, and sprang up and down, striving to grind him into the earth. Both Batard's hind legs were broken, ere Leclerc ceased that he might catch a breath. Ah, ah, he screamed, incapable of speaking shaking his fist through sheer impotence of throat and larynx. But Petard was indomitable. He lay there in a helpless welter, his lip feebly lifting and ringing to the snarl he had not the strength to utter. Leclerc kicked him, and the tired jaws closed on the ankle, but could not break the skin. Leclerc picked up the whip, and proceeded almost to cut him to pieces, and each stroke of the lash crying, Distame, I break you, eh, by gar, I break you. In the end, exhausted, fainting from loss of blood, he crumpled up and fell by his victim, and when the wolf-dogs closed in to take their vengeance, with his last consciousness, dragged his body on top of Batard, to shield him from their fangs. This occurred not far from sunrise, and the missionary, opening the door to Leclerc a few hours later, was surprised to note the absence of Batard from the team, nor did his surprise lessen when Leclerc threw back the robes from the sled, gathered Batard into his arms, and staggered across the threshold. It happened that the surgeon of McQuestion, who was something of a gadabout, was up on gossip, and between them they proceeded to repair Leclerc. Merci non, he said. Do you fix fares, de dog, to die? Non, it is not good, because he ma must yet break. That foe, what he must not die. The surgeon called it a marvel the missionary a miracle, that Leclerc pulled through it all, and so weakened was he, that in the spring the fever got him, and he went on his back again. Batard had been in even worse plight, but his grip on life prevailed, and the bones of his hind legs knit, and his organs righted themselves. During the several weeks he lay strapped to the floor, and by the time Leclerc finally convalescent, Shallow and shaky, took to the sun by the cabin door, Batard had reasserted his supremacy among his kind, and brought 
not only his own teammates, but the missionary's dogs, into subjection. He moved never a muscle, nor twitched a hair. When, for the first time, Leclerc tottered out on the missionary's arm, and sank down slowly, with infinite caution, on the three-legged stool. Bon, he said, Bon, de good son, and he stretched out his wasted hands, and washed them in the warmth. Then his gaze fell on the dog, and the old light blazed back in his eyes. He touched the missionary lightly on the arm. Mon Perry, that is one big devil, that petard. You will bring me one pistol, so that I drink, de son, in peace. And thenceforth, for many days, he sat in the sun before the cabin door. He never dozed, and the pistol lay always across his knees. Bittard had a way, the first thing, each day, of looking for the weapon in its wonted place. At sight of it, he would lift his lip faintly, in token, that he understood, and Leclerc would lift his own lip in an answering grin. One day the missionary took note of the trick. Bless me, he said, I really believe the brute comprehends. Leclerc laughed softly. Look you, mon pere, dat what I now spike, to dat does he listen. As if in confirmation, Batard, just perceptibly, wriggled his lone ear up to catch the sound. I say keel. Batard growled deep in his throat. The hair bristled along his neck, and every muscle went tense and expectant. I lift a gun, so like that, and suiting action to word, he sighted the pistol at Batard. Batard, with a single leap sideways, landed around the corner of the cabin, out of sight. Bless me, he repeated at intervals. Leclerc grinned proudly. But why does he not run away? The Frenchman's shoulders went up in the racial shrug that means all things from total ignorance to infinite understanding. Then why do you not kill him? And the shoulders went up. Mon Paris, he said after a pause, detame is not yet. He is one big devil. Some tame I break him, so an, so all, to little bits. Hey, some tame, bon? A day came when Leclerc gathered his dogs together and floated down in a bateau to Forty Mile, and on to the Porcupine, where he took a commission from the P.C. Company, and went exploring for the better part of a year. After that, he pulled up the Koya Cuck to deserted Arctic City, and later came drifting back from camp to camp along the Yukon, and during the long months Batard was well lessened. He learned many tortures, and notably the torture of hunger, the torture of thirst, the torture of fire, and worst of all, the torture of music. Like the rest of his kind, he did not enjoy music. It gave him exquisite anguish, racking him nerve by nerve, and ripping apart every fiber of his being. It made him howl, long and wolf-like, as when the wolves bay the stars on frosty nights. He could not help howling. It was his one weakness in the contest with Leclerc, and it was his shame. Leclerc, on the other hand, passionately loved music, as passionately as he loved strong drink, and when his soul clamored for expression, it usually uttered itself in one or the other of the two ways, and more usually in both ways. And when he drank his brain a lilt with unsung song, the devil in him arose and rampant. His soul found its supreme utterance in torturing Batard. Now we will have a little music, he would say. Eh, what you think, Batard? It was only an old and battered harmonica, tenderly treasured and patiently repaired. 
but it was the best that money could buy, and out of its silver reeds he drew weird, vagrant airs that men had never heard before. Then Bittard, dumb of throat, with teeth tight clenched, would back away, inch by inch, to the farthest cabin corner, and Leclerc, playing, playing, a stout club tucked under his arm, followed the animal up, inch by inch, step by step, till there was no further retreat. At first, Batard would crowd himself in the smallest possible space, groveling close to the floor, but as the music came nearer and nearer, he was forced to uprear, his back jammed into the logs, his forelegs fanning the air, as though to beat off the rippling waves of sound. He still kept his teeth together, but severe muscular contractions attacked his body, strange twitchings and jerkings, till he was all a-quiver, and writhing in silent torment. As he lost control, his jaws spasmodically wrenched apart, and deep, throaty vibrations issued forth, too low in the register of sound for human ear to catch, and then nostrils distended, eyes dilated, hair bristling, in helpless rage, arose the long wolf howl. It came with a slurring rush upwards, swelling to a great heart-breaking burst of sound, and dying away in sadly cadenced woe. Then the next rush upward, octave upon octave, the bursting heart, and the infinite sorrow, and misery, fainting, fading, falling, and dying slowly away. It was fit for hell, and Leclerc, with fiendish keen, seemed to divine each particular note and heart-string, and with long wails and tremblings, and sobbing minors, to make it yield up its last shred of grief. It was frightful, and for twenty-four hours after, Batard was nervous and unstrung, starting at common sounds, tripping over his own shadow, but withal, vicious and masterful, with his teammates. Nor did he show signs of breaking spirit. Rather did he grow more grim and taciturn, biding his time with an inscrutable patience that began to puzzle and weigh upon Leclerc. The dog would lie in the firelight, motionless for hours, gazing straight before him at Leclerc, and hating him with his bitter eyes. Often the man felt that he had bucked against the very essence of life, the unconquerable essence that swept the hawk down out of the sky like a feathered thunderbolt that drove the great gray goose across the zones that hurled the spawning salmon through two thousand miles of boiling Yukon flood. At such times he felt impelled to express his own unconquerable essence, and with strong drink, wild music, and batard, he indulged in vast orgies, wherein he pitted his puny strength in the face of things, and challenged all that was, and had been, and was yet to be. There is something there, he affirmed, when the rhythmed vagarities of his mind touched the secret chords of Batard's being, and brought forth the long, lugubrious howl. A poulet, a poulet, out with bot, my hands, so and so, ha ha, at his phone, at his ver phone, de priest chant, de woman's pray, de man swear, de little bird go peep peep, betard him go yow yow, and at his all de ver same thing, ha ha. Father Gautier, a worthy priest, once reproved him with instances of concrete perdition. He never reproved him again. It may be so, Mon Pierre, he made answer, and I think I go true hella snapping, like the hemlock tro de fire. Eh, Mon Pierre? But all bad things come to an end as well as good, and so, 
with Black Leclerc on the summer low water in a poiling boat, he left MacDougall for sunrise. He left MacDougall in company with Timothy Brown and arrived at sunrise by himself. Further, it was known that they had quarreled just previous to pulling out, for the Lizzie, a wheezy ten-ton steer-wheeler, twenty-four hours behind him, beat Leclerc in by three days, and when he did get in, it was with a clean-drilled bullet hole through his shoulder muscle and a tale of ambush and murder. A strike had been made at sunrise, and things had changed considerably. With the infusion of several hundred gold-seekers, a deal of whiskey, and a half-dozen equipped gamblers, the missionary had seen the page of his years of labor with the Indians wiped clean. When the squaws became preoccupied with cooking beans and keeping the fire going for the wifeless miners, and the bucks with swapping their warm furs for the black bottles and broken timepieces, he took to his bed, said, Bless me, several times, and departed to his final accounting in a rough-hewn oblong box, whereupon the gamblers moved their roulette and fargo tables into the mission house, and the click of chips and clink of glasses went up from dawn till dark and to dawn again. Now Timothy Brown was well beloved among these adventurers of the North. The one thing against him was his quick temper and ready fist, a little thing for which his kind heart and forgiving hand more than atoned. On the other hand, there was nothing to atone for Black Leclerc. He was black. As more than one remembered, deed bore witness, he was as well hated as the other was beloved. So the men of Sunrise put an antiseptic dressing on his shoulder and hauled him before Judge Lynch. It was a simple affair, he had quarreled with Timothy Brown at MacDougall. With Timothy Brown he had left MacDougall. Without Timothy Brown he had arrived at sunrise. Considered in the light of his evilness, the unanimous conclusion was that he had killed Timothy Brown. On the other hand, Leclerc acknowledged their facts, but challenged their conclusion, and gave his own explanation. Twenty miles out of sunrise, he and Timothy Brown were poling the boat along the rocky shore. From that shore, two rifle shots rang out. Timothy Brown pitched out of the boat and went down bubbling red. And that was the last of Timothy Brown. He, Leclerc, pitched into the bottom of the boat with a stinging shoulder. He lay very quiet, peeping at the shore. After a time, two Indians stuck up their heads and came out to the water's edge, carrying between them a birch-bark canoe. As they launched it, Leclerc let fly. He potted one who went over the side after the manner of Timothy Brown. The other dropped into the bottom of the canoe, and then canoe and poling boat went down the stream in a drifting battle. After that, they hung up on a split current, and the canoe passed on one side of an island, and the polling boat on the other. That was the last of the canoe, and he came into sunrise. Yes, from the way the Indian in the canoe jumped, he was sure he had potted him. That was all. This explanation was not deemed adequate. They gave him ten hours' grace, while the Lizzie steamed down to investigate. Ten hours later, she came wheezing back to sunrise, there had been nothing to investigate. No evidence had been found to back up his statements. They told him to make his will, for he possessed a $50,000 sunrise claim, and they were a law-abiding as well as a law-giving breed. Leclerc shrugged his shoulders. But one thing, he said, a little what you call a favor, a little favor, that is that. I give my $50,000 to de church. I give my husky dog, Batard, to the devil. De little favor fears you hang him, and Dan, you hang me. It is good, eh? Good it was, they agreed, 
that hell's spawn should break trail for his master across the last divide, and the court was adjourned down to the river bank, where a big spruce tree stood by itself. Slackwater Charlie put a hangman's knot in the end of a hauling line, and the noose was slipped over Leclerc's head and pulled tight around his neck. His hands were tied behind his back, and he was assisted to the top of a cracker box. Then the running end of the line was passed over an overhanging branch, drawn taut and made fast. To kick the box out from under would leave him dancing on the air. Now for the dog, said Webster Shaw, sometime mining engineer. You'll have to rope him, Slackwater. Leclerc grinned. Slackwater took a chew of tobacco, rove a running noose, and proceeded leisurely to coil a few turns in his hand. He paused once or twice to brush particularly offensive mosquitoes from off his face. Everybody was brushing mosquitoes except Leclerc, about whose head a small cloud was visible. Even Batard, lying full stretched on the ground, with his forepaws, rubbed the pests away from his eyes and mouth. But while Slackwater waited for Batard to lift his head, a faint call came from the quiet air, and a man was seen waving his arms and running across the flat from sunrise. It was the storekeeper. Call her off, boys, he panted as he came in among them. Little Sandy and Bernadette just got back in, he explained with returning breath. Landed down below and come up by the shortcut. Got the beaver with him. Picked him up in his canoe, stuck in a back channel, with a couple of bullet holes in him. Other buck was clock clothes, the one that knocked spots out of his squaw and dusted. Eh, what? Eh, say, eh, Leclerc cried exultantly, dat de one, fo sho, I know, I spike true. The thing to do is to teach these damned shishwashies a little manners, spoke Webster Shaw. They're getting fat and sassy, and we'll have to bring em down a peg. Round in all the bucks and string up the beaver for an object lesson. That's the program. Come on. Let's see what he's got to say for himself. Hey, monsieur, Leclerc called, as the crowd began to melt away through the twilight in the direction of sunrise. I like very much to see de fond. Oh, we'll turn you loose when we come back, Webster Shaw shouted over his shoulder. In the meantime, meditate on your sins and the ways of providence. It will do you good, so be grateful as is the way with men who are accustomed to great hazards, whose nerves are healthy and trained in patience, so it was with Leclerc, who settled himself to the long wait, which is to say that he reconciled his mind to it. There was no settling of the body, for the taut rope forced him to stand rigidly erect. The least relaxation of the leg muscle pressed the rough-fibred noose into his neck, while the upright position caused him much pain in his wounded shoulder. He projected his upper lip and expelled his breath upwards along his face to blow the mosquitoes away from his eyes. But the situation had its compensation. To be snatched from the maw of death was well worth a little bodily suffering, only it was unfortunate that he should miss the hanging of the beaver and so he mused till his eyes chanced to fall upon Batard, head between forepaws, and stretched on the ground asleep. And there Leclerc ceased to muse. He studied the animal closely, striving to sense if the sleep were real or feigned. Batard's sides were heaving regularly, but Leclerc felt that the breath came and went a shade too quickly. Also, he felt that there was a vigilance or alertness to every hair that belied unshackling sleep. He would have given his sunrise claim to be assured that the dog was not awake, and once, when one of his joints creaked, he looked quickly and guiltily at Batard 
to see if he roused. He did not rouse, but a few minutes later he got up slowly and lazily, stretched, and looked carefully about him. Sacred dam, said Leclerc under his breath, assured that no one was in sight or hearing. Batard sat down, curled his upper lip almost into a smile, looked up at Leclerc, and licked his chops. I see my finish, the man said, and laughed sardonically aloud. Batard came nearer, the useless ear wobbling, the good ear cocked forward with devilish comprehension. He thrust his head on one side, quizzically, and advanced with menacing playful steps. He rubbed his body gently against the box, till it shook and shook again. Leclerc teetered carefully to maintain his equilibrium. Batard, he said calmly, look out, I kill you. Batard snarled at the word and shook the box with greater force. Then he upreared, and with his forepaws threw his weight against it higher up. Leclerc kicked out with one foot, but the rope bit into his neck and choked so abruptly as nearly to overbalance him. Haya, chook, mush on, he screamed. Batard retreated for twenty feet or so, with a fiendish levity in his bearing that Leclerc would not mistake. He remembered the dog often breaking the scum of ice on the water hole by lifting up and throwing his weight upon it, and remembering he understood what he now had in mind. Batard faced about and paused. He showed his white teeth in a grin, which Leclerc answered, and then hurled his body through the air in full charge straight for the box. Fifteen minutes later, Slackwater Charlie and Webster Shaw returning, caught a glimpse of a ghostly pendulum swinging back and forth in the dim light. As they hurriedly drew in closer, they made out the man's inert body, and a live thing that clung to it, and shook, and worried, and gave to it the swaying motion. hi Chook! you spawn of hell! yelled Webster Shaw, but Battered glared at him, and snarled threateningly, without loosening his jaws. Slackwater Charlie got out his revolver, but his hand was shaking as with a chill, and he fumbled. Here, you take it, he said, passing the weapon over. Webster Shaw laughed shortly, drew a sight between the gleaming eyes, and pressed the trigger. Batard's body twitched with the shock, threshed the ground spasmodically for a moment, and went suddenly limp. But his teeth still held fast and locked. End of Batard by Jack London Read by Robert Scott, June the 28th, 2007